Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> hey, 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 don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila. Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Uh, before we get started, we, we've got, uh, this is a big, it, it's a big day. It's probably the most important thing that's going to happen on tonight's show. <laughs> it is, of course, our annual listener's choice drawing. Is it semi-annual, bi-annual? Semi-annual. It is it semi-annual. It is tri-annual. It's a trifecta. It's a trifecta. Um, it is, is our listener's choice drawing. Uh, and we are very excited about this because we've got some great uh, comments and suggestions on Facebook. And uh, so here we go. We've got we've added everybody who has commented on Facebook. Everybody who's been in on Facebook, we've added them to the list uh, since the last listener's choice. 
And now we've got a random, we've got a hat, and uh, it's spangled. And I'm going to push the button right now. Push the button. Drum roll, please. (laughs) Our next listener's choice episode is going to feature the voice of Michael Cook talking about The Great Escape. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That's fantastic. That's great. I haven't seen that in a while. That's going to be a fun one to talk about. I know you were hoping for Dirty Dancing. I was, but... Still, Great Escape. That is great. That's Ernest Borgnine, right? It's a lot of people. It's Steve McQueen. It's yeah. Ernest Borgnine. It's uh, uh, Richard Attenborough. Uh, yeah. Classic. So that one is going to, uh, that'll be right after our Fritz Lang series, right before our little, uh, uh, what do we call it? Our Challenge for Each Other series. I don't know what we called it, but it's going to be good. <laughs> it's going to be good. Well, thank you, everybody, too, who has written in on Facebook. We sure appreciate it, and this is going to be a great conversation. Uh, I can't wait to uh, I can't wait to dig in with uh, Michael. Thanks for, for suggesting The Great Escape. That's a great, great choice. Absolutely is. Right. Yes, it is. Let's do this, Andy. Let's tell the people where we're from. Where are we from? This is The Next Reel uh, on Rashpixel.fm, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that over there is Andy Nelson. Hello, hello, hello. And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, the second in our classic Fritz Lang series with his largely under-criticized 1928 film Spies. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app, or join us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And if you've ever seen a clown do that one trick on stage that he can never do twice, then you should hurry up and jump on the tiny car for the next reel's Instagram hashtag pony prize hashtag guess the movie challenge. And with that, let's try to catch up with Games Master Stephen Smart to find out who won before his train crashes in the tunnel. Hey guys, and uh, this week we slipped back to the late fifties for a slice of Douglas Sirk and Imitation of Life from nineteen fifty nine. Starring Lana Turner. Congrats to at Skifton Kristen who nailed it on Image One. You are entered into the 2016 Pony Prize hat. As always, a new challenge starts on Monday. So thanks, guys, and see you later. And we've got some follow up on the blot spot. We were uh, a little bit further afield than friend of the show Ben Lott. Yeah, Ben says, Metropolis is a very interesting blend of genres. It is a sci-fi film that mixes together themes of classicism, science, religion, and politics. Personally, I didn't have as much of a struggle with plot holes, although I certainly noticed them. I was impressed with how much this film felt ahead of its time, and those matte paintings and stop-motion miniatures were spectacular. Your rank 201, my rank 91. Top 100 for Ben. I'd say that's a winner. Well, I'm, I'm glad we did it. I am too. I mean, I like I said, I it may not be in my like top 100 films, but it certainly is a film that uh, I find mesmerizing to watch. So it's the one I'll definitely return to. For now, Andy, I, let's do trailers. So my trailer, mm-hmm. I really am looking forward to this. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I love a good horror movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I know you don't love a good horror movie. I'm really curious what your read on this one is going to be, because it looks like maybe not so much just a, a straight out horror as much of as a thriller. And, you know, the look of this, it's, it's the film called Don't Breathe. The story is a, a, a pair who decides to break into this house where this, uh, this guy supposedly has some riches stashed. And he's blind, so they figure, hey, you know, we can kind of sneak around in the house quietly and get his stuff. Well, it turns out this guy has a little more up his sleeve than uh, than maybe they thought. And uh, it's he really kind of goes nuts. Stephen Lang plays the blind man, and uh, it, he is... Um, what was he? He was in uh, uh, Avatar. Oh, Avatar. He was a bad guy in Avatar. All the Avatars. Miles Quaritch. Yes, yes. So I'm curious to see how he continues in the rest of the Avatar films. So we've got Dylan Minnette, who I think is always a great actor. Just one of those young up-and-comers who's just brilliant in everything he does. Uh, Jane Levy and Daniel Zavato as these kids who are in this house. And they are trying. You know, This blind man comes across them 
and has his gun and he hears one of them and shoots and kills this one. And so now the other ones are trying to get out. But then at some point they they get like, it looks like into the basement where they find that this guy apparently likes to keep other people chained up and locked up. And it's it looks like a really, really just a creep fest. And I've heard nothing but good things about it. Very excited to see this one. It's directed by uh, Fede Alvarez, who did the recent remake of Evil Dead. And, you know, a lot of people didn't like that, but... It, I guess I'm one of those weirdos who I just really don't like the Evil Dead films at all, but I liked his. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm the backwards one, clearly, but I really did enjoy what he did with Evil Dead. It was pretty gruesome. This one doesn't look quite so gruesome, but it sure looks terrifying. What did you think? Well, uh, first on your Evil Dead, I am with the rest of the world. I really didn't like it, and I didn't see it, and I don't even think I got through the whole trailer. So <laughs> really terrible. Uh, in this case, I am stoked for this movie. How did nice. that happen? No, this trailer it. was awesome. I love the whole concept. I love the idea. I love it. But maybe it's because of my, my uh, you know, Daredevil fetishism right now. Uh, I'm actually wearing the red leather suit as we did. We do this. I'm. I love that show. I love the whole idea. And so taking that principle and doing all that crazy stuff um, in in this kind of a, a, a context, uh, this this excites me. This yeah. it's really haunting. Um, so I'm I'm excited about it. What I'm more excited about is that on IMDb, you know how it has the section right below the photos. It says people who liked this also liked. Uh huh. Okay, so I did that search, and I came up with uh, uh, 31 and Green Room and uh, the Valley of Violence and The Waiting and all these really appropriate uh, films to that, that I can understand why people who liked this film also liked those films. Right. And the number one pick there is Sausage Party, an <laughs> animated movie about one sausage's quest to discover the truth about his existence. I can't wait to see how that relates. That's I see. very Don't funny. Don't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> very, very funny. Yeah, looks really good. When's it come out? Uh, this one is coming out August, late August, August 26th. It looks like, uh, you know, it opened at South by Southwest, and it's going to be a pretty good release um, August 26th into uh, early September. And it looks like at this point, the Netherlands, September 28th, is kind of the latest of its release dates that are uh, out there. My trailer, Andy, is I don't know what to make of my trailer. It is Heller High Water, uh, director David McKenzie, writer Taylor Sheridan, stars Ben Foster, Chris Pine, and Jeff Bridges, uh, playing the role of Chris Christopherson. <laughs> uh, this is the story of a, a divorced dad and his ex-con brother resorting to a desperate scheme to save their family's farm in West Texas. Uh, and so these two guys, uh, Chris Pine and Ben Foster, they decide they're going to rob a bank. And so it's a bank robbery movie. The trailer, I have to admit, like, it looks good. It's pretty. It's another one of those trailers that I'm very excited about because they chose great music. In this case, it's Blackwell's version of Knocking on Heaven's Door. It is really uh, uh, haunting. And so I really enjoyed the sort of artistry of the trailer. I'm worried that uh, that the movie might be a little slow. Yeah, I... I'm I'm curious about this one. It looks like something that I could be interested in. It also looks like it just it may not quite make it there. I I'm um, I love the all the actors in it, and just from watching the trailer, it looks like there's going to be some great characters uh, from these three um, leads. But yeah, I'm not quite sure if the story is going to be that different from things we've seen before. Still. It's certainly one that I'd rent, maybe not watch in the theaters, but it's definitely one I would check out. This is definitely on the list. Anything, I mean, Buck Taylor's in it, for crying out loud. Uh, Buck Taylor, Dale Dickey, uh, you know, these are, it, it is a great, it, it's a great cast. I think it's going to be a really, uh, uh, it's an interesting chance for a lot of great actors to do great, great character parts. This one, uh, it's, it's a little bit earlier than yours, August 12th in the little U.S., earlier. A little bit earlier, uh, it, it opens, uh, It actually, gosh, what's today? Today's the 16th as we record this. Right. It's playing right now uh, in France. It's it's a can. Oh, uh, that's why it's playing. We get to see it in August, Netherlands in October, and uh, I don't know, it doesn't have any dates for any place else. Sorry, rest of the world. <laughs> You'll have to wait. <laughs> Please, Andy, let me stay here. Don't send me away again. I won't take any more space than a little dog.
Spies, Andy, 1928. Now, neither of us had seen this film. It was uh, directed by uh, Fritz Lang. It was written, uh, the novel was written by Thea von Harbo uh, and Fritz Lang for the screenplay. Thea von Harbo, at the, I believe at the time they were married. Is that correct? Yeah, they you were know? married, I think, until 33. Until 33, yes. Okay, yeah. so uh, they were married. In the, stars Rudolf Klein-Roga, uh, Gerda Marus, and uh, Willie Fritsch is number 326. Uh, it is uh, the, uh, uh, what did they say? It's the second to the last silent film that Fritz Lang directed before he moved into the talkies. And uh, there we go. This is, I, I'm going to tell you, Andy, I had fun watching this movie. I had problems with it, but I had fun. How did That's it do for exactly you? where I am. That's totally where I am. Um, the, I think that this is something that, uh, in a lot of silent films, there's just they hadn't quite figured out the story construction yet, so it's hard to kind of look at it with modern screenwriting eyes because I mean there's definitely uh, plot holes all over the place with this and Metropolis, but the style is so much fun. Fritz Lang is having a blast making this. I mean, you can just tell the way that he's just kind of all over the place with the story, and it's just it is a vibrant, energetic film that uh, feels very different from Metropolis. It's an interesting follow up to that film because they definitely have different uh, a different vibe going for each. So it's great to see that he kind of can step out and do different things. And this is really a fun movie to watch, despite any problems that you'd have with it. Um, the, the film is about uh, a, a... Yeah, explain it. Let me hear you. I have no idea. <laughs> the whole story is about uh, this, this gentleman, Hagi, who is the banker by day, criminal mastermind by night, and he is always a few steps ahead of everybody else, the, the police, the, the government, the state-sponsored spy agents, and we have this dapper Agent 326 who, really, they, they hadn't figured out uh, numbering conventions because... But but at least we can see that 007 came from somewhere. I love that. Right? We meet him. He is in under. He is uh, undercover. Uh, he goes through a number of costume changes and look changes. This agent three twenty six. We never find out what his name is. Uh, it, he he goes from a, a dirty sort of uh, uh, hobo uh, into uh, into this dapper. Uh, you know, suit wearing lad uh, who's who's quite fine, and uh, he and this beautiful um, criminal spy fall in love. That causes everything to go uh, awry, as you would expect. This is a spy versus spy story with the romance twist, and it is very much a predecessor to uh, all of the great spy stories that we watch today, uh, and I find it really fun, and I think I was most surprised that uh, at just how well the spy versus spy trope holds up in silence. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun, and it was. I totally agree with you that looking at this and seeing all these tropes that we are just so accustomed to now in modern spy films and kind of seeing kind of a, a birthplace for it. I mean, I don't know if it's really the birthplace. There may have been other things, but I mean, it feels like the cinematic birthplace for, for all of this sort of stuff, whether it's the, all the little cool spy gadgets and the, um, the numbering of the spies and the, the counter spies and the, you know, the, the sexy spy that our hero falls in love with and the, the also sexy um, spy who who woos the uh, you know the good information out of somebody. I mean, there's so many things going on. Oh, and then of course, not to mention uh, you know Haggy, who is totally like the foundation for for Blofeld, and not to Absolutely. mention like Doctor Strangelove. I mean, yes, <laughs> it's so interesting. And Doctor Strangelove and like Stalin. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, uh, there he is. Uh, Definitely a, a model for evil. Yeah, I didn't mention Doctor Strangelove last week, but certainly, uh, you know, Rudolf uh, Klein Roga seems to, in these past two films, have thrown a lot of information Kubrick's way for the foundation of that character. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I I really like about the way this is put together, and and I should say in my synopsis, which was generally terrible for this film, uh, I did not bring anything up about the Japanese and the treaties. Uh, because I was confused largely about the Japanese uh, engagement and the treaties. The whole thing I thought was going on in the in the, the film, the whole purpose of the film, uh, was that Klein Roga had somehow gotten his hand 
on the um, uh, we'll we'll call it the codex, right? <laughs> right? The the book of spies, and so now he knows who all the undercover spies are. Uh, and and that is definitely a part of it. He has this book of spies in the beginning. He goes through, and he already knows who three twenty six is. He's well aware of three twenty six, even though three twenty six thinks that he's totally undercover. Uh, but I I think I misplaced my attentions and got super confused by the the introduction of all these treaties and such. Yeah, that was a little confusing. I think. I mean, I'll try to see if I can. Uh, if I can nail it, I think what was going on is there was this Japanese treaty that if it was signed was going to change the way that the business relations happened between Asia and Europe that would in a very big way um, affect the business dealings that Haggy was doing with his bank. Oh, I think. yeah. And so, and so he wanted to stop this treaty from one, trying to... Uh, prevent it from being signed, and then if that failed, which it did, of of preventing it from being delivered to Tokyo, which he does succeed at. So I think that is um, what is happening there. Okay. I had a feeling there was something like that, and I love the way the the treaty handoffs play out with uh, Masimoto and his delivery boys. Uh, I think that's fascinating. We can talk about that in a little bit. But um, but boy, getting there was a mess. And the opening sequence of the film uh, was horrendously bad. Fun. What? Fun, but horrendously I bad. Like, I, it is so impossible to follow the first, like, five minutes of the film, which makes it hard to get into. I don't know. I, I actually got into it pretty easily, and I, I, was, I found it very refreshing, the the way that he jumped into this world without giving us a lot to go on, we really just kind of had to just go like grab and hold on tight and just see if we could kind of keep up. And I thought that was fantastic. I really, um, really loved the whole opening of this. It just felt so fresh and different from Metropolis, just the cuts, the the way the story was playing out with these, you know, these, all these heists of people stealing stuff and killing people to steal their paperwork and everything. Um, leading up to our introduction of number 326. I thought it was just fabulous. I I would give it two thumbs up. Oh, I have two thumbs directly sideways. I was just <laughs> ba- pointing at each other. I was baffled by the, all those handoffs. And I think I, I think that is one of those areas where, uh, it, you know, it reminded me so much of like Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, um, you know, the, the segments I had to read over and over and over again. You know, it's just maybe it's just I, I recognize that sometimes when I dive into these these kinds of stories, my brain might not be functioning on all cylinders until I get a few pages in. That was what I experienced here. I just hit vapor lock so early trying to keep up with the names and the faces, not even the names, just the faces and the suits um, that uh, I got super confused until until I started, you know, I found myself able to lock on to a familiar face. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a pretty abrupt beginning, but then it's pretty quick. Uh, we do get yeah. to meet Agent 326, and we stick with him for quite a while as we kind of glean his role in this. We see he's not just this bum, but he's actually this uh, super spy. He's a super spy. He ends up hiding behind uh, um, a shaving cream and a an uncommonly happy butler fellow. <laughs> uh, there's some great kind of slapsticky uh exchanges that that it's funny a film like this because it it really is you know we said it's a it's a predecessor to some of these spy action films that that really uh, slide in and out of of what I would normally characterize as stereotypical um silent film slapstickery uh it, it and and I think Metropolis and this largely uh, shy away from that sort of trite handling, uh, and yet sometimes it it does it, it adds some of the levity back into this film, which is otherwise fairly, you know, fairly serious. Uh, and I really like that. I mean, I found it it ended up being paced pretty well. I saw the the uh, what is it the hundred and seventy eight minute. Oh, was it that long? Yeah, something like that. One hundred forty or one hundred forty four minutes. Okay. One hundred forty what. Minutes. Well, okay, so uh, here are the IMDb technical specs say runtime 178 minutes, uh, DVD edition 144 minutes. Yeah, I think that it also suffered from uh, uh, quite a loss of its footage for a while. Yeah. I, I and they think only the original recently... was, yeah, just an hour and a half. Yeah, I think they cut or they cut quite a bit, or I, I'm not exactly sure what happened if it just got destroyed, but um, it wasn't until 2004 where they took an old nitrate print that was being stored somewhere and they were able to kind of restore most of it. And I mean, it looked 
I thought it looked pretty solid. So, okay, what were the big highlights for you? You can't say enough how much spy films after this pulled from this type of storytelling with the double crosses and the triple crosses and the quadruple crosses and just everything. I mean, it seemed like everybody ended up being like a counter spy of some sort, Holy like man. some random stranger in the street. No, they're a spy too. I just loved that. It was like, it was so fun in the way that it just kind of took this world and just made it like so untrustworthy. You can't trust anybody. I loved the bit when he's... um doing the paperwork, and I, I can't remember specifically what it was for, but he had to fill out this form, and he goes to this little table, and, the, and this other guy who's in there breaks all the pens, except for the one, and we find out why afterward, because um, after our hero leaves, this guy goes, and he lifts the pad that this guy was writing on, and he has this secret, like, carbon copy thing underneath it, and he's copied the whole message, and it's, it's brilliant. Just, all this stuff. And then not to mention, this was, I think, my favorite bit, the fact that Haggy ended up not only running the bank during the day and being this master criminal by night, he also was an agent for these guys. He was number 719, and he's also a clown. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> it's crazy. And I, it, the reveal that he could walk. I mean, that was just a fantastic reveal. Uh, when all of a sudden he stands up from his wheelchair. There's so much stuff going on in here that uh, just was thrilling. And sure, the story, uh, I mean, it's very much, if you if you step back and you really kind of analyze it, it's written very specifically so that this movie can actually happen. Like the fact that these newspapers print like so ridiculously fast that the news is out like the minute it happens and these people get informed right away. It's like, I don't think that's exactly how it worked. But you know what? It's all in fun for this this great spy movie. So I, I'm all for uh, the way that this story is told. I think it's just a lot of fun. So Fia von Harbo uh, was married to Rudolf Klein Roga. Yes, we didn't mention that last week. We did not mention that. Do you, do you think any of their uh, changing uh, allegiances in real life impacted the <laughs> the allegiances and double crosses in the movie? This is one of those sorts of relationships where I, I feel like there's a little bit of a, a Bill and Hillary sort of thing going yeah. on. You know, she was very much uh, kind of of the Nazi mindset. So she had a, a different political mindset. She ended up, I believe, directing what? some of her own projects. Pray tell, what are you saying about Bill and Hillary? I'm not saying they're Nazis. I'm just <laughs> go, saying. Go ahead, dial that they, back. Go yeah, ahead. They, <laughs> they had a uh, a relationship that seemed to focus more on the work and less on their actual um, love for each other. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. And so she focused more on her work and. On this film, he actually started an affair with Gerda Maurus, uh, who plays Sonia, and that uh, that relationship lasted for a little while. And you know, they would still go hang out with his wife and stuff, and and or he she would know that he was going out with her, and he would take her out, on, take Gerda out on the town, and his wife didn't seem to care. It was just very much <laughs> that sort of relationship. So I don't know how much Rudolph cared. I I guess it's just such a fascinating relationship. I'd I'd be I'd love to be in the room with those four people and just kind of see if there's tension or if they all are like, yeah, cool. It's you know, it's pre sixties. <laughs> This was, yeah, you know, I mean, this wasn't this how it was like on Friends? <laughs> exactly. Nothing's now changed. That would be a great sitcom. That's right. <laughs> Lang and Friends. <laughs> Lang and Friends. Uh, yeah, I think it was, it, That's it's just crazy. Um, there, there are some other cultural things going on. I mean, too, it, it, it's it's hard not to, to watch this and think about the impact of her um, sort of pro, um, pro-state uh, mindset. So she was very much a co-conspirator in the rise of the Nazi Party and the, the National Socialist German Workers' Party. And, uh, and ultimately, that's what drove uh, them apart. Now, I understand. Did you read uh, anything more about uh, Fritz Lang and his invitation uh, by Joseph Goebbels to join the party to to lead yeah uh, the um, the uh, national film organization right right yeah crazy and it was one of those oh sure yeah let me just go get my things I just need to call my broker <laughs> and uh, next thing you know he's, he's on it he's in, in Paris Hollywood yeah well he or, went yeah, to he spent some time in Paris and, yeah and he went there yeah. did his 
did his Paris, uh, the Paris years. So it was, uh, it's an interesting thing to watch their, to, to sort of watch this film in the eyes of, with the eyes of their relationship and, you know, history in mind uh, that, that ultimately broke them, uh, broke them apart. It, uh, it was one of those things that happened to people. I mean, I think the DP, uh, when that whole thing changed, I, I think his output uh, diminished quite a bit. I think in this particular case, most of the cast managed to kind of weather it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, but it's one of those things, yeah. Like we talked about last week, it could make or break a career. Direction, Fritz Lang. How do you? How did this one change for you? Did you notice anything different uh, between this film and the last in terms of the way he approached the screen? Well, like I said, I mean, I, I really loved that this felt so vibrant. Metropolis. Uh, it certainly had its action moments, as especially as we built toward the end. But it felt very. Um, uh, kind of meticulous and planned and and uh, things kind of took their time a little bit more in that. You know, you got the marching and everything. This one uh, feels just very energetic right out of the gate. And I think that, it, like I said earlier, it's just he had a good understanding of the different genres. Uh, now, reading, uh, I've been reading some of his uh, biography, which is uh, uh, quite interesting, The Nature of the Beast uh, by Patrick McGilligan. And um, he said that a reporter who was visiting the set said that Lang's methods appear to be unchanged. He, uh, quote, Lang sees everything, makes everything himself, supervises the makeup of actresses. He controls all the details of the costumes, the furniture and props. He's infallible. Um, He seems to really kind of be the guy who, I mean, he loved, he was a guy who loved that credit, a film by Fritz Lang, um, and wanted to make sure he had his uh, thumbprint on every single detail in the film. Um, He was, um, in this particular case, because of his relationship with Ufa, which had soured quite a bit after Metropolis and his uh, gargantuan overspending on that particular film, he ended up creating his own production company here. And I can't remember what it was called. I think it was just Fritz Lang Film GmbH. And um, although Ufa still distributed it, he had to be a little more careful with the budget because it was uh, not being provided for by Ufa. So um, what I read was that he was generous with his salaries, but he was almost wasteful with his footage. And reading about him and the way that he directs, it sounds kind of like David Fincher. He would just like excessively uh, take shot after shot after shot. Um, trying to get the details exactly the way that he saw them. There's one story where um, the when the glass plate behind Sonia is is shot and uh, Agent 326 has to like pull her out of the way, um, Fritz Lang insisted on being the one who aimed the bullet and took the shot himself uh, because he was convinced that the actors had to be afraid to make the audience afraid. And uh, he also was unhappy with the way the bullet hole uh, went in. So he tried a shotgun, he tried a slingshot, he tried pistols, all sorts of different firearms until he finally was satisfied. I think it was like 20 some takes of shooting this plane (laughs) behind her head. Did you look for his hands? I noticed hands everywhere in this film. And I also, I remembered there were quite a few actually in Metropolis. There's always those like worker hands, the shots of the hands, yeah, uh, reaching up. And this one, I mean, right out of the gate, we see the hands um, picking up papers. We see the hands. uh, I loved the hands that would just randomly reach in and and help out uh, Haggy, like lighting his cigarettes or whatever for him. And it took me a while to realize, oh, he's got a nurse here with him at all times. But at first, it was just like these random hands that kept poking in i there were a, a number of um of production elements that i thought were really uh lovely it was funny this film did not carry over the grandeur of metropolis insofar as it carried over the detail in in many of the the set pieces uh what is your sense of how this one compares to just uh, just the overall production look yeah i think you're right i mean it wasn't wasn't nearly as uh, magnificent a look. Um, that being said, it was uh, still it uh, it had a look and it was it it, it fit what uh, they were doing here. And I know the budget was less and they the shooting. I mean, geez, Metropolis was like nearly a year or more than a year. This one was like you know fifteen weeks. It was super tight, so they just cranked this thing out. And um, uh, but the look, I mean, I thought the production design by Otto Hunt and Carl Volbrecht. Um, who worked on Metropolis, I, I thought it had a nice look here. Yes, the walls kind of just all kind of had kind of a, a gradient sort of look to them, um, but it still felt 
uh, it felt kind of it, it expressionist in its own uh, spy world way. Well, and some of them did. It was interesting the way the sets tended to match the character that dominated that set, right? Um, it, for example, uh, Klein Roga's set beneath the, the bank uh, was very sparse with the exception of his desk. It could have been practically a news desk, right? Right, yeah. Uh, except for it was like a transformer. <laughs> you know, pieces would slide in and out of it, like it would move around and all that stuff. But the walls were absolutely bare. That the uh, the uh, uh, you know, it was just ever. It was very simple and stately and and you know, barren. Uh, and yet, we go into some of the other sequences, the downtown sequence in particular. There's this lovely, just mat, the sort of expressionist mat, the circus circus mat on the wall behind the 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 street lamp and. There are just some wonderful kind of bar sequences that that I think are are much more detailed and sort of match the characters as they move through them in a way that that I think accentuates their uh, their sort of on screen personality. I thought that was uh, really interesting. I loved the um, the like little in and out slits in the desk that would shoot newspapers up. For yes, <laughs> no, right? That's very clever. Oh, it was uh, great. I love the live orchestra at the boxing match. Uh, that <laughs> ends up into a dance. turns into a dance. Yeah, a really crazy dance. Um, th- there were a couple of other things I noticed about the the um, um, that I I wanted to talk about. First of all, this this seems like, and I I as I was reading up, one of the things that I noticed that he does here more than other films is this this insert these insert cuts that seemed really novel in this film where we're looking at one thing and we jump we do a jump cut in on the detail and then back out right uh these insert cuts on objects that was new in his overall structure of these films yeah it's a it's a nice little touch i I think it all looks good you're not excited you're not excited enough about the about this as a novelty no, I, it was. I was just I, in my brain. I was uh, kind of thinking. I'm like, does he? Does that happen in Metropolis? And I, I can't quite recall. It does not. It no. does not. I tell you now, sir. Well, there you go. That's right. And it was. I think that was really. I mean, in terms of evolution of of uh, just evolution of production of the of the editing process, this is a novelty. And this is something to be excited about. It really is. I mean, commence the jubilation. It's amazing what Lang pulls off. And I mean, that's what's great about going back and looking at a lot of these silent films is seeing what these uh, filmmakers just were coming up with as they played with this new medium and kind of invented it as they went along. And you definitely see mistakes. I mean, there's a lot of uh, crossing the line. Uh, throughout mm-hmm. as they're as they're making these uh putting these scenes together but it's like they didn't quite know what that meant yet and it took a little time before they could really kind of figure that out but you know that being said I mean we're talking a lot about the production design and cinematography uh by Fritz Arno Wagner who uh you know he was kind of a key cinematographer in the silent era and into the early sound era one of those guys whose name is just very critical to uh, German film. I worked with Lang and Murnau and uh, Pabst, and I, I think that uh, I think this was his third of four films. No, second of four films that he would work on with uh, Lang. He did Destiny in 1921, and then he's going to do M after this, along with the Testament of Doctor Mabus. Um, but you know, he did Nosferatu. He's done a lot of amazing things, and he. Uh, they do a lot of fun imagery things. And also something else that, uh, you know, they did have some in Metropolis as well, but I love the um, where they overlay images on other images or text on other images. And when Sonia is trying to figure out why that 33-133 is so familiar to her when she sees it on the train uh, before she realizes that that was the number on the, the paper, you've got that great imagery of that number kind of like dancing around on the train or moving with its wheels and it's really fun. I loved the way they played. I, I made that same note. What is up with that? Is that a is that a representation of what? Her delusion or some sort of increasing stress or pressure? Um, whatever it is, it is something that you know uses this strange superimposition of these numbers to to move the story forward. And I really liked it. Yeah, they do the great. same thing. It's actually I should say it's not numbers, but just using superimposition. Uh, they do the same thing with Doctor Masamoto uh, in uh, before he kills himself. They superimpose the Japanese flag uh, over him as he realizes that that he has been betrayed. And I think that's a really cool sequence um, as as we realize sort of what has happened and. 
the guys who show up are like zombie couriers. They're like Japanese ghosts. They're uh, <laughs> terrifying. It was I so love it. scary. It was just great. Uh, be, it, it, can you? How did the, can talk about the the sequence with the couriers? Can you can you do that? These were the Japanese. Um, couriers that he had given these letters to, one of which was the actual treaty that had been signed, and he was tra- telling them all to get to Tokyo. Very effective storytelling, because we have uh, a guy come into Haggy's office and deliver two of these, and so we know that two guards are killed, and then somebody brings in the third one, and we know the third guy is killed. And I, it's a super effective storytelling. And then when Matsumoto finds this out, um, these three guys as ghosts, almost like his conscience, like he knows that he's going to have to commit Harry Carey now um, because he has um, fallen for this woman who deceived him. And so he's got to right the wrongs that he has made. And it's uh, I, I love this, this ghostly um, uh, presence of these guys kind of almost commanding him, but just kind of just there as his conscience, making sure that he goes through with it. Yeah, it, it's pretty grim. So the use of of these funny sort of camera tricks um, to to move the story forward, I think, is is just you know, like you said, going back to these old films when it was actually novel. Um, there's that's a fascinating lesson. Considering I spent all day doing the same thing to spoof an Adele video, <laughs> seeing these powerful tools that our that our ancestors, our filmmaking ancestors, had created, it has come so far. Fritz Lang is rolling in his grave. <laughs> 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 I gave them these tools, and this is what they this do. This is what they've done. <laughs> oh, so funny. Let's talk cast, Andy. We've got to start with Klein Roga, right? Yeah, sure. I, I think Haggy is great. Um, and I already mentioned kind of the precursor of, of uh, Blofeld and Dr. Strangelove. Not to mention you know, all the spoofs that have come. I mean, Austin Powers, you certainly see a little bit in here. Um, I loved him. I think he's just great in here. I love that he's got this strange system of hand signals that he delivers to his nurse when he's sending her messages across the room. <laughs> I don't know what was up with that, but I thought it was just awesome. And I think that needs to be in a James Bond film. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right. Hand signals to the nurse. That was right. Who was it in the train wreckage that it was it? Was it Willie Fritch uh, as 326? Who whose hand comes out of the wreckage and shoots With like a gun. periscope, like a periscope? Yes. <laughs> yep. It reminded was... me of the trash compactor monster in Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> See, even George Lucas is stealing from this. He film. is. He's stealing from uh, this. I uh, thought that was so great. What do we know about Willie Fritch? He's a great German actor who uh, had been around, but uh, Lang uh, nabbed him for this and his following film, The uh, Woman in the Moon. And uh, he's an actor who managed to kind of ride through the the Nazi wave in Germany and make it out the other side. He never really kind of committed. And uh, and I think he kind of uh, had a career that lasted into the 60s. So you know, he was around for quite a while before he uh, passed away in 1973. I thought he was a great dapper young lad. And uh, it was he, he certainly served the role. Uh, he has a ton of credits. He's a guy who looks the uh, looks great as a bum, but then he also cleans up really nice. Yeah. And I thought that was great introducing him as a bum because he just fit that part so much. And then to see him finally uh, clean up once he's met Sonia to uh, kind of woo her and uh, take the next steps in their in their. Uh, you know, search for whatever it is they're, they were doing at the time. I thought uh, it was great. I mean, I think he worked well playing both of those parts. I think he was a singer, too. It's like he's got a number of, of uh, soundtrack hits from uh, that are still going on. One of his tracks was in Inglorious Bastards. Well, word on the street is he sang this entire part uh, in the film, but because it's silent, uh, we just don't get to enjoy it. See, now I can't tell if you're joking. I can't tell if you're joking, and that's really mean. Oh, so funny. <laughs> so funny. No, it was Lillian Harvey's duet with him from the 1936 film Glückskinder. Yes. And uh, yes, uh, they sing the song, I, I think it was called I Wish I Was a Chicken. Ich wollte song, ich war ein Hund. It can be heard playing on a phonograph in the basement scene, uh, La Louisiane, as well as in the extended scene, Lunch with Goebbels. Um, where uh, Goebbels happily sings a portion of the song after deciding to hold a private screening of the film. Because who wouldn't? It's very catchy. 
How about Gerda Marus? Lang found her, uh, I believe, while he was doing Metropolis, or maybe before Metropolis. He saw her on the stages in Vienna and was just taken by her immediately and told her, hey, I want you to come be in my movies. She was like, oh, why would I want to do that? I'm I'm doing great on the stage, and I'd much rather be on the stage. So she stayed there, and uh, but then times got really tough. She was touring Germany. She came to uh, town and called him up, and uh, he happened to be filming Metropolis. And he instantly took a meeting with her and said, I've got to cast you. Uh, you're perfect. And so she became his ingenue, and he helped her get used to the camera and kind of figure out how to screen act and everything. And, of course, their affair began. And um, uh, But unlike, uh, uh, well, I should say, like the rest of his actors, he still was really hard on her. Um, during the production, there was a point where she actually had to go get her appendix removed, and he would not let her take it easy despite the doctor's orders. Um, he was making her sprint. He was digging through train wreckage, standing. She was standing for prolonged periods of time. She ended up devel- developing severe conjunctivitis because she was just so um, ill from having her appendix out <laughs> that she would. Do, she was doing all of her rehearsals with her eye, one of her eyes closed to the point where she was weeping from the pain. It was so bad. And, and he just uh, either didn't notice or purposefully didn't notice that she was having issues and just pushed on. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. But the thing with her is she delivered exactly what Lang wanted. And so Lang kind of uh, kept her around and I believe put her in his next film, Woman, Woman in the Moon. Um, she was one of those uh, lights in his life and, and a discovery that he made. Um, Leon Dyers, who plays Kitty, also happened to be one of those uh, women. Unfortunately, he was not that thrilled with the performance that he gave her, so her part got diminished in the course of the story, and her close-ups uh, weren't as lovely as Gerda's, and Gerda had all sorts of lovely close-ups and uh, got all the royal treatment of the film. So that's what happens when you please or don't please Fritz Lang. Lupu Pick as Dr. Masimoto. It was funny seeing Lupu Pick as Dr. Masimoto because I was like, is, is he Japanese? I don't think so. He's not. He's Romanian. Yeah. And uh, But he does have a vaguely uh, sort of Pacific yeah. uh, look about him. Because this was this was not his only his only film to play uh, to play uh, someone of Asian descent. Right. He he is he's played others in uh, other German films where he plays an Asian uh, character. But uh, he is uh, he's fascinating here, and he's he's like the he's like the Asian Monopoly guy in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> he's like Asian money bags. It's the Japanese stereotype of the monopoly guy, according to nineteen uh, twenties German filmmakers. That is funny. Yeah, this was his last film. Um, he ended up dying a few years afterward, nineteen thirty one. All right, you wanted to talk about Fritz Rasp? I just loved his character here, and it was such a different uh, as here. Here is Colonel Jalusic which was so different from his character in Metropolis as the Thin Man. Mm-hmm. I uh, and I really loved his mustache. <laughs> Exactly. Now that is how you wear a mustache. If you're going to go, go big, people. There you go. Yeah, he was great. One of apparently uh, Lang has quite a number of suicides in his films, and this is um, the first of four suicides that we see over the course of the film. He kills himself. Uh, Masamoto, uh, of course, commits Harry Carey. Harry Carey. You've yeah. got uh, Morier who eats the cyanide pill, and then of course the big finale at the end, which I we didn't even mention, but uh, the ending with uh, Rudolf Klein Roga as Hagi when he's dressed as a clown, and he's got that amazing speech, uh, pulls out a gun, screams curtain, shoots himself in the head, and dies, and yeah. then that's the end. And that's the end. And I, this was what I thought was novel about this is just the number of suicides that are just right on screen. Uh, yeah. All we see all of them. Even right. the close-up, you know, headshot, and obviously they they don't have the effects uh, that we do today. But but it it's not as if um, you know these older films were hiding anything or pulling any of their punches. I mean, they definitely showed it. And I I was wondering. I, it made me want to look into, uh, which I haven't had time to do yet. The the first use of these um, these suicides on screen. Like I I don't remember hearing of any you know you know use of the cyanide pill on screen. That felt very novel to me. 
Yeah, it did. Uh, I mean, Jalusic, we don't see him. We see we see them cut to the gun on the table. We don't oh, see him kill point. himself. Yeah. And and with uh, Masamoto, we stay on his face while he slits his belly open, which is. Uh, but we see him afterward, I mm-hmm. guess, as, mm-hmm. as he as he rolls over and dies. You're right. It's it's very novel. I'd be curious to know um, at what point in cinema did uh, did suicide first uh, end up on screen and and how it was uh, received. Yeah, right. There is a um, uh, there's a great article on Wired. Uh, oh, those movie spies and their cyanide pills. Um, that uh, that doesn't trace quite enough history, but it does have some very cool. Uh, photos and things we'll put that in the well, show notes of course here in phoenix we had the guy who was in court and when they announced him guilty he bent over and put something in his mouth and chewed it up and it was a cyanide build and he killed himself wow so straight out of the out of the spy movies right here in uh, phoenix there is a, a photo here which you can't obviously can't see i'm gonna send it to you just look at this this is let me just tell you the caption is cyanide damaged teeth oh god <laughs> That's a horrible pair of teeth. Yeah, really bad. There's that. I'm gonna put that in the show notes. That's a, awesome. That's from the spy, the spy museum, <laughs> <laughs> the International Spy Museum in Washington. Man, I want to work there. What are we doing this thing for? <laughs> the spy museum. That sounds fun. Yeah. I wonder if all the people who work there are secretly spies. Oh, I'd have it no other way. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can't work here if you're not an actual spy. <laughs> We've talked a little bit about the uh, you know production getting it made, the the trouble that Metropolis put them in, uh, and Lang's new company. What else do we have to learn from uh, from getting this thing produced? The uh, the film did decent business, and uh, but Ufa, not one to uh, to hold back when they released a film, since they did come on board to distribute this. Um, they just, I guess, they had just fantastical special effects at the theaters where it was playing in. Um, and I guess at the actual premiere where they had the big premiere with everybody, they had a giant stylized eye with floodlights beaming from the pupils that would light up the crowd. Um, it sounds like a really fun <laughs> premiere to go to with these giant eyes. And I like all the poster imagery. I mean, they, they came up with some really great stuff of these eyes looking everywhere. And I, I really enjoyed kind of that element of the distribution for this film. Totally agree. Uh, generally, the artwork, and what's funny about the artwork is that it actually has a very Metropolis vibe to it uh, in terms of some of the Art Deco style. Yes, it does. I think it's really funny that it doesn't necessarily carry over into the film itself, but the, the marketing was terrific. You know, one thing that bummed me out about it is I don't know if uh, Werner R. Hyman's score exists still, but the music that I heard was not that great. I was really unimpressed with the score that I had to sit through for this film. You know, I was not wholly unimpressed. There were some sequences that I thought were really nice. Most of them were the solo pieces, solo piano, solo oboe. Uh, they, As soon as they became... Uh, less of these sort of solo statements, musical statements, and more punctuation to other orchestral cues, I I found myself losing interest in the music. And it became more and more painful as the film went on, uh, because it's long, uh, that uh, you're right. I mean, the music is... I would have been interested in hearing the original score, too, because the music overall doesn't hold up in spite of, I think, some nice nice moments. Yeah, some nice moments, but on the whole, it just felt... I don't know, just felt like they weren't quite... Uh, there yeah some of the i think that some of the solos are they they do a great job of pairing these solos with some great avant-garde like down angles in the shot like when we first meet uh what's her name in the bar she's kind of dressed as a gypsy what is it was it uh was it kitty it was a kitty yeah it, it there's this great down angle there's another one where we meet agent in the very beginning we meet uh, uh roga in the wheelchair and number 37 comes in his arms are waving and he's got these crazy eyes you know there's some a great pairing of music there uh and, and so there are some things that really stand out in terms of visual uh these great dramatic visuals up or down angles that i think are just fascinating they're pretty few and far between in this film yeah but um interesting nonetheless how did it do 
You know, this is one of those movies where just nary a record exists as far as what they spent or what it made. I looked high and low and just could not find anything. If it does exist somewhere, please send it my way if you know where it exists, uh, our dear listeners. But what I did find in his uh, biography said, if the budget wasn't exactly shoestring, the circumstances were more modest than under Ufa's auspices and adjustments had to be made. The director was quite capable of revising plans and budgets as long as he accepted the conditions and capable of creating provocative quality films under stringent circumstances. It was creative supremacy, not financial freedom, that was Lang's true obsession and his Achilles heel. So it sounded like they had still had a decent budget to work with. And then uh, it, it did, it seemed like it did okay. The critics were divided on it. Some said it was a load of garbage, despite the flashy and extravagant effects. Others said it was enormously entertaining. But on the whole, people kind of felt like, considering what Metropolis was, it just it was a little bit anticlimactic. The reception, um, audiences loved seeing Greta Maurus in the film. But on the whole, they kind of walked away... Um, feeling a little uh, eh, and uh, it kind of was forgotten for a long time. Which I think is unfortunate. I think this is, you know, I opened with this uh, largely under-criticized film, I, I, and I'm I'm not saying that it was criticized poorly or, or that, you know, it was criticized as a not great film, but that it isn't thought about enough in, in terms of his uh, overall catalog. I mean, it, everything I read was that that overall analysis and study of this film is sparse, few and far between. And I think that's a shame because it really is fun. And I'm telling you, if we have to flick chart this next to, uh, next to Metropolis, I'm going to pick this one. I had more fun watching this movie. I'm kind of torn. It's one of those things where I feel like I, I can pull more from Sp- uh, from Metropolis when I watch that one. But this one is way more fun. And I, I think largely I would pick this one over Metropolis just for that reason. Well, I think we should, in, in honor of that statement, we should do it. Let's go rank it. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel, everybody, and uh, sign in with your account. You know how we do it. You just do a search for spies. It's a little bit harder to find. This is the 1928 spies, not spies like us. Not spy. No, spy versus spy. Not uh, what's the what's the Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Smith. Uh, Smith. Don't spy. don't choose Mr. that Mrs. one. Spy. That's also that's also a spy film. It is just spies, uh, otherwise known as what? How would you say it? Spion. Spione. Spione. Like, I don't know. Yeah, I know you're making stuff up now. Let's do it. All right. First up, we have spies. Or oh brother, where art thou? No, I can't do. I can't do it. I'm still oh brother. Yeah, I'm definitely the oh brother block sticks. You know, I d- I don't know if we said it, but man, did people know how to smoke and spies? <laughs> <laughs> they were just constantly <laughs> clouded it, in smoke. Oh, it was like wow, and vaping didn't even exist yet. But no. look how much smoke these guys are producing. <laughs> what are they smoking in those things? <laughs> That was great. All right, spies are the Sandlot. So here's here's my problem with this this pick. I I'd probably pick um, spies. I'm not sure if I would pick spies after the recency has kind of shaken free. Yeah, I, I that's kind of where I am. I would go Sandlot first. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Spies or the Hudsucker Proxy? Oh, but definitely Hudsucker. I would do spies. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right, one, one two, two, three, three paper. Bed. What did you say? <laughs> what did you say in your, what was your I losing thing? I forgot what we were doing. And did I, you say I, Pez? I said head. Oh, no, you lose on principle. I do. Head? I, well, last week we talked about head, hand, and heart, and my <laughs> my brain went blank, <laughs> and I said head. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, do I, I don't. I'm I, maybe I'm feeling generous. Well, just so you know, if it loses to Hudsucker, it's going to be below Metropolis on our list. And if you're okay with that, so you're saying <laughs> it it has to beat Hudsucker. I am saying that. Then then let's go Hudsucker. I not that we're going to game the <laughs> vaunted flick chart ranking. We would never want to game the sacred flick chart ranking. But let's go ahead and say uh, spies. Oh, you're saying spies. Okay. Oh, yes. No, you, you said yeah, I'm just saying, you know, in the right. in quiz show style. Right. I'm going to choose right. spies now. All right. Next up, we have spies or the bishop's wife. 
I do spies. Uh, yes. All right. Next up, we have spies or the red shoes. I'm going to go the red shoes on this one. Me too. The red shoes takes it. Spies or the parallax view? I'm going the parallax, oh, parallax view. Parallax view, yeah. All right. We've got spies or the game. This um, one's for Nick Langdon. The, I'm for, saying the game. Yeah, I'm saying the game. <laughs> All right. And spies or seconds? I am saying seconds. Seconds. Puts it at 197. Number 197. Yeah, so it breaks 200, but barely. You're right. And it, it beat out Metropolis. Yeah. So. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, so where, what does that do for your letterbox view? And you know what I realized? Did mm. we do, we didn't do letterbox last week. We no, got we totally sidetracked. And it's did not, we? I don't think it's in the show. I listened to it several times because I was putting sneaking chapters in and, uh, and I couldn't find it. In the end, huh? I may have totally blacked out. Well, I know we. I know I wrote it down. I know you wrote it down. I don't hear it. I don't it. remember. I don't, I don't remember like hearing it. it. So we got. What does this do for your letterbox this week? Uh, I'm at three and a half. Three and a half. That seems to touch high for me. It's it's exactly where Metropolis is. I I feel these are both on par. And actually, I think it would have been a little lower if it wasn't for the ending. And it actually took me a few days to kind of stew on that ending where I just kind of, I was really amazed that that's how he ended the film. Yeah. And it uh, ended up, I ended up bumping it up. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I put it on par with Metropolis. And this is one of those ones where I feel like I'm going to go back and forth as to which one I prefer. Over yeah. Them. I That really surprises me because I I suddenly wanted this. I felt like I wanted this one to be a three star and I wanted now uh, Metropolis to be two and a half. <laughs> I, and so I'm, I'm okay with revising history just a little bit in my head. So I'll give you three and a half on this one as long as I, I, I could. I guess now I should bump it up even higher uh, to four stars. Wow, yes, my inner monologue is I, I really know. terrible right now. Should I stop you or let you keep going? <laughs> this is the no, best I'm spy gonna... movie ever. <laughs> uh, no, I'm going to go three and a half stars with you, uh, and I'm going to shut up. Okay, well there you have it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there you go. Where do we go from here? We're we're still uh, keeping on, keeping on with our fantastic um, Fritz Lang series. Yeah, we're wrapping up his silent films, and uh, we're skipping his next one, which is Woman in the Moon. Uh, which is his last silent film, and we're jumping over that to talk about M. Like uh, I said last week, we're talking about a lot of his M uh, films, yeah. the films that start with the letter M, and here, of course, is the letter M. <laughs> 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 so we'll be talking about it. This is like a Sesame Street film, it is, isn't it? Very much so. Uh, uh, this I hear is it's Peter a good Lurie, one for right? the kiddies. Peter, Peter Lorre, right? I haven't seen this either. Have you seen this? Oh, yes. I have yes. not this seen This was it. definitely a film school film. Oh, good. Oh, I love getting film school, Andy. <laughs> uh, I look forward to it. Uh, and we also have, let's see, uh, before that, we've got a uh, trailer rewind coming up next week. And this is uh, this is a good one. They're doing Comet. And you know what else? I think they, they take us to school a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I still need to watch that one. I know. Me too. I actually want to after hearing this show. So I look forward to getting that out there. Uh, and uh, so there you go. Trailer Rewind on Tuesday, and uh, M will come up next Thursday. I think that's Fantastic. it, Andy. i got to go to bed. All right. Well, I've got to go get my clown outfit on. Time for my next performance. <laughs> Amazon giveth, Andy. Um, I'm going to give you one. I did a, uh, this is a, a three star that I think I came up with. Three star. This is a, a three star because, frankly, the one and two stars, you took the only good one star, and Thank the you. two Thank stars you. were even, were, there was like one of them, and it wasn't very good. So uh, here we go. And I'm picking this one because I think, uh, largely, I agree with its central point. Impressive, but overlong, says Steiner Vine Voice. 
on uh, December 10, 2005. Fritz Lang's silent crime thriller pits a government agent against a scheming international banker who is stealing government documents. Considered an overlooked but crucial part of Lang's impressive canon and an important influence on thrillers of Alfred Hitchcock, it does have some first-rate cutting and painterly images of the city's dense layering. However, this version, at least, is simply way too long. One can anticipate what's going to happen later in the film with more than a half hour to go. The film could easily afford to lose somewhere in the order of one hour of its footage, a necessary viewing for anyone interested in the work of Fritz Lang, all the same. I agree with that. It's too long. I could have used it cut down quite a bit, but I still love it. There you go. I, I, can, I, can, I can agree with that. Well, I've got the one star, apparently, the yeah. uh, good one star, who says, Stupid! I love silent movies. By Cyrus on May 20th, 2015. Cyrus says, in short, stupid. I love silent movies. Go watch Thief of Baghdad for a real masterpiece. Here, except for the first two minutes, which was visually interesting, albeit with ridic synth music, <laughs> the rest of the movie suffered from a poor plot, poor visuals, and poor acting. The synth music made it even worse. Now, I don't think mine had synth music, but I didn't again, it wasn't music. that great. I know there are two scores out there right now, so maybe the synth is the other version. I don't know. Regardless, you know, Cyrus, I, I don't know. Sorry, Cyrus. Sorry. Thanks, Amazon. It is hard to believe we have been having in-depth conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. Season 5 had some great adaptations, like our Meryl Streep Oscar-nominated performances series. We covered adaptations like Kramer vs. Kramer, Sophie's Choice, and The French Lieutenant's Woman. It's a real Sophie's Choice between those books. <laughs> you see what, I, <laughs> see what I did there? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I don't think it's quite at the level of a real Sophie's Choice. We also did Snowpiercer for our Bong Joon-ho series, adapted from the French graphic novel Le Transpersonnage. Man, I love that movie. We had our two-part 1939 series that included adaptations like Gone with the Wind, Ninochka, The Women, and The Hound of the Baskervilles. A number of those 1939 movies, like Goodbye, Mr. Chips, also tied into our recent 1940 Academy Award Best Picture nominee series. Our naughty children horror series had creepy adaptations like The Bad Seed, Village of the Damned, The Innocents, and Children of the Corn. For our Hayao Miyazaki series, we talked about his take on Lupin the Third with the Castle of Cagliostro, plus his own The Wind Rises. Some great listener choice picks, too. Viridiana and The Great Escape. And for our David Mamet Wrights series, The Verdict, The Untouchables, and Glengarry Glen Ross. Plus, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang from our Shane Black series adapted from Brett Halliday's novel, Bodies Are Where You Find Them. Dive into the sources for all of these at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support the show. Check out thenextreel.com slash originals today and find your next read.